Good evening and welcome to our program tonight. This is the Word and Sword TV broadcast coming to you live from WHKY Studios in Hickory, North Carolina. And uh, if you would like to call in during this program, you're most welcome to do that. We want to thank you for taking the time to tune in tonight and study the Bible with us. We appreciate that so much. Uh, operators are standing by right now. If you'd like to call in with your Bible question, uh, you can leave it with them. Or if they you pass the screening that they're going to uh, ask you a few questions. If you pass that screening, then you can be on the program live. And uh, we can have a, have a conversation. This program is your program. So call in with any Bible question you have. You can also call in and ask for a copy of this presentation or a free Bible correspondence course. Uh, you can ask for a free tract. <clears throat> and a tract is nothing in the world but a printed sermon. Uh, you can ask for a map to our building or uh, instructions on how to get there. You can ask to be added to the quarterly uh, mailing that we give of the Beacon, which is our monthly bulletin. And you can get free Bible study aids at www.wordandsword.com. That's www.wordandsword.com. And if you would like to, uh, we're going to put this up on the on the uh, screen for you, so you. This information. And again tonight, call with your biblical question or comment, and we will do our best to give you a book, chapter, and verse answer tonight. If we cannot do that sufficiently, or if we, uh, you still have some questions, then we will uh, take your name and we will send you material that will answer your question thoroughly. The number is 828-485-5555. That's 828-485-5555, and that will be scrolling uh, throughout, the, throughout, throughout our broadcast tonight. <clears throat> so. If you do have um, an opportunity to call, please do, whether you agree or don't agree. Uh, nothing wrong with just calling in and letting us know that you appreciate the program. That's okay, too. Uh, you can like us on Facebook by going to www.facebook.com slash word and sword and uh, post there if you would like a, a question answered. Or you can go to www.facebook.com slash Newton with a capital N, North Carolina, both, both capitalized, and then Church of Christ. And uh, you can also follow us on Twitter at Word and Sword and post there if you have a question. But uh, again, please make this program your program and call in tonight if you have any Bible questions. Call tonight at 828-485-5555. The question of salvation is the most important question in the world, friends. <clears throat> What must I do to be saved? And what does the Bible say that a person has to do to be saved? Does a person actually have to do anything? We're going to talk about that tonight on our program. But the chart you're watching and looking at right now uh, is God's plan for salvation, how a person is saved. Now certainly, we know from the book of Ephesians that, that the Lord, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, that we are saved by grace through faith. Now notice that's a dual obligation. God's part is grace. Our part is faith. And we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. But God has provided a plan for us through His grace. And we must be obedient to His plan. His plan involves us hearing His Word. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. He that keeps see, hears these sayings of mine and does them, uh, he is one that God is pleased with. He's like a man builds his foundation on rock. Now we must believe in John 8, 24, except you believe that I am he, you'll die in your sins. Romans 10, verse 10, we know that, um, that, that we must believe in order to be saved. Galatians 3, verse 26, we know that we're all the children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. In Hebrews 11, 6, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So we must have faith that is essential, and faith is a work in and of itself. Also, we must repent of our sins, and repentance involves a change or a turning in our life, changing from one behavior to another. Luke 13 and verse 3, Acts 2 and verse 38, and Acts 17 verse 30. Times of these of ignorance God used to wink at, but now commands men, all men everywhere to come to repentance. So that's a command. Uh, and also, we must confess Christ with our mouth. I don't know of anybody in the religious world that would say this doesn't have to be done. Uh, but again, to those that say it's all by grace, you wouldn't have to confess if it's all by grace. 
So we'll talk about that in just a few minutes also. <clears throat> so we must confess with our mouth in Acts 8, verse 30, 27 through 39 with the Ethiopian eunuch. He wanted to be baptized and uh, he was told by Philip, if you believe, you can. He said, well, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And that was after having Christ preached to him. So after he confessed with his mouth, he was baptized in water for the remission of his sins. Also, Mark 16, verse 16, Jesus says, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. In Acts 2, 38, And in brethren, what shall we do? And uh, Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for or in order to obtain remission of sins. Galatians 3, 27, We put Christ on in baptism. 1 Peter 3, 21, Talks about baptism saving us. Just as in the days of Noah, that is, eight souls were saved by water, so is it with baptism does also now save us. Not the washing of the filth of the flesh, but the interrogation of a good conscience toward God. Now, after you have done all these things, you are born into the family of God. It is not the water that saves you. It is not any one of these works in and of themselves that saves you. It is being obedient to what God has told you to do, to, to all that what God has told you to do. These are the works of God, friends. And you can't be saved without doing the works of God. Faith, repentance, and confession bring us unto Christ. Baptism is where we reach the blood of Christ and where our sins are remitted by that blood that is applied to us in the waters of baptism, Romans chapter 6. Jesus wants us to die, to be buried, and to arise, just like he did. So we, may, we, we are died to sin, we are buried in water, and we are raised to walk a new life. When are we new? After we have been baptized, not until. Now after we do that, the Bible also talks about us being faithful. We can fall away. If you fulfill these commandments, Acts 2.47, you'll be saved and the Lord will add you to his church. The Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Now to everyone who says that, you, that the church has nothing to do with it, we bring you to Acts chapter 2 and verse 47. Who did the Lord add to his church in Acts 2 and verse 47? The church had been established on the day of Pentecost. The Lord added to his church daily who? Those who were being saved. All the saved are in the Lord's church. Now, not everyone that says they're saved, friends, is saved. It is possible to be honestly wrong about your salvation. And when a person that is sincere truly comes to the reality of that, it makes them a little bit angry. It upsets them that they have missed it all this time. But you can change that. You can be obedient to the gospel and you can recognize that you must live faithfully. Now, in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10, it says, Be thou faithful unto death, and thou shalt receive the crown of life. Matthew 24 verse 13 says, We must continue in the things that we know to do that are right. Now that argues that we cannot continue in them. We are free moral agents. In 2 Peter 2 and verse 22, it talks there, a very distasteful passage, but it talks there about a Christian who falls away, that it is like the dog that has returned to his vomit and the sow that has been washed to their wallowing in the mud. Now that's the picture that God gives through the Spirit and reveals to us of someone that falls away. Now, to those who say they never were saved, You've got situations in the book of Revelation in the first two, chapter 2 and 3 where five churches are told that they better straighten up or they'll be removed from God's candlestick being among them. Now, what does that mean? These are people that are Christians and they're told to repent. Can a Christian so act and so behave himself in such a way as to sever himself anew from Christ? Yes, he can. Now, someone says, well, once you're in grace, you're always in grace. Well, is that what the Bible teaches? Or is that what your preacher teaches you? Is that what you've always believed? Now, the eternal security of the saints is one of the tenets of uh, Calvinism. But understand this, that Calvin was wrong on that. And there were many people, not only uh, many scholars of his day, 
didn't buy that. If you think about it, if we are once saved, always saved, friends, there is nothing we can do. Nothing. To sever ourselves from the Lord ever again. You could be the biggest reprobate, kill people, do whatever. And that point has been made by many Baptist preachers that I know who have said that nothing could separate you from Christ once you are in Christ. Well, friends, the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches that you can fall away. In Acts chapter 8, Simon the sorcerer, a very new convert, behaved in such a way as where he was described as being in the gall of bitterness and the bond of iniquity. He was in sin. What was he told to do? Repent and pray God that the thought of your heart might be forgiven you. All right. So that tells us that Romans 3.23, all sin and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin, Romans 6.23, is death. But we don't have to die in our sins. God is long-suffering to us, not willing that we should perish. Friends, think about this and get this clearly in your mind. God does not want anyone to go to hell. That's not his desire. Now that doesn't argue that people will not be lost. But it is not God's desire that anyone should be lost. But you can choose. I can choose whether I am in the right relationship with God or whether I'm not. And that's on us. God has done what he's going to do to redeem mankind back to himself. But it's man's choice to decide to serve or not serve, to obey or not to obey, to submit or to rebel. That's on us. And what we need to ask ourselves tonight is are we in rebellion to God? Or are we in submission to God? Because the answer to that question means everything. If you're in rebellion to God and you died right now, you'd be lost. Anyone that's that way. But God again is gracious. He is full of mercy. And the very fact that you were able and I were able to take another breath just a minute ago or just right now is an argument that God is long-suffering, giving us every chance that we can have to be right with him. In Acts 16 and verse 30, the Philippian jailer asked a question, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Have you been converted? We're going to talk tonight about conversion in the book of Acts particularly. Two instances, one in the book, one in Acts chapter 2, and one in, uh, on down in Acts chapter 3 and 4 of the Samaritans. Samaritans. So if you would, get your Bibles, be ready to turn with us. Go ahead and, and look at those two passages if you would like. And we'll be talking about that. But first of all, we want to talk to you about conversion. We talked a little bit in kind of a kind of a overview of what we talked about last week about conversions. And one is that in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 47, we find the first example of those people that were under the new law being obedient to Christ. The church was established on the day of Pentecost in the town of Jerusalem about the year 33 AD. Any other congregation that's out there today calling themselves the Lord's church that is past that date is not the Lord's true church. Well, what is a convert? A person who is converted or one who has brought over, been brought over from one belief or party to another. To bring about a religious conversion, to alter, to change from one form to another. These are all definitions, English definitions, of the word convert or converted. Matthew 18 verses 3 and 4, Jesus said, Assuredly I say to you, unless you are converted and become as a little child, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, stop right there if you will, and let's go and look at that on the, on the charts if you can. What he says there is that it is essential for us to be converted and become as what? As a little child. Not become a little child, but become as a little child. Let's come back to the charts, please. All right. 
Thank you. All right, so we must be converted and become as a little child. Now, the little girl that's represented here in this picture, is she, is she a sinner? What do you say? Is she a sinner? And John Calvin said, yes, she is. A number of people who believe in Calvinism will tell you that, yes, that's exactly right. Well, Jesus said that we must become as a little child or we can by no means enter into the kingdom. Now, if you follow the doctrine of total hereditary depravity, in other words, that we are totally evil, and no bit of good in us, when we are born, then this child would have to be baptized in water for the remission of her sins, immersed, in order for her sins to be washed away. And she'd have to do that voluntarily. She'd have to be able to confess with her mouth that Jesus is the Son of God on her own and be convicted of that. This is an innocent child, friends. They're in right relationship with God. They are safe in the arms of Jesus. And Jesus said so when he says that you are converted and become as a little child. So we must become innocent. How do we do that? Well, we submit to Jesus Christ in baptism. Whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. All right, so you see the parallels there? You see how some of the doctrines that are taught today in different churches just really don't fall into place with what Jesus taught? Jesus taught that children are safe, friends, but people in denominations, perhaps the denomination that you, that you are involved in, Ask your preacher and ask him if do we believe that children are lost and must be uh, blessed or saved in some way? Do we baptize babies? You know, is that something we must do? Well, in Acts chapter 3 and verse 19, notice here the word convert is used and it's the word repent. Repent, therefore. Repentance involves a turning from something and be converted. So the process of repentance includes conversion, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. So repent and be converted. All right? Have an intention to turn your life around and be converted, be changed. Not be recycled into the same old person you've always been, but to change, okay? To change. James 5, verse 19 and 20, if anyone among you wonders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way saves a soul from death and covers a multitude of sins. All right? Some have, someone would wonder from the truth if anyone among you, you see that? Going back to that idea we talked about before that you can't fall away. James talks about those who might wander away from the truth. And then we must turn them back. And when we do that, we turn a sinner. So the one who wanders away is among the brethren. He's a brother. And he is a sinner. He must be turned back from the error of his way. And when someone brings him to that point, he has helped him to be in right relationship with God and he has prevented him from committing a multitude of sins. Now converting a person who is a convert in Luke chapter 15 verse 11 through 24 we see the process of conversion. The prodigal son is talked about there a very moving passage but notice the prodigal son did not just merely have a change in action he had a change of heart didn't he? He didn't change his knowledge. He did have a different knowledge, but he didn't change it just in knowledge or just in conviction. He was convicted he was doing the wrong thing. But he wasn't right with his father yet, was he? Although he had knowledge of his sin. It's not just a change in allegiance. Because he was ready to be a servant of his father. But that still did not put him in right relationship. It's a change in thinking and a change in will. The will must be broken. The thinking must change. We are different people than we used to be. 
a change in commitment that results in a change in relationship and a change in identity. Now the change in relationship and identity is given by God. When a person is committed, a person is changing his will and his thinking and his allegiance to the world and his conviction and his knowledge. He is doing all those things and then when he does that, the Lord, and he's obedient in all that God has said, then God changes the relationship he has with him. So basically, in our words, it's a change in who we are, how we talk, where we go, what we do, how we dress. All these things are different now. And that is conversion. A lot of people have been, as they talk about it, have been changed to some degree, but they have never been converted. Because they want God to come to them and save them on their terms. And they dictate to God. In Psalm 19, verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect. It converts the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Notice that word convert. It, the law of the Lord converts. How does it do that? It's, it convicts us of our sins. The law of the Lord does that. Notice it doesn't say the Spirit does that. But the Spirit does do that through the Word. And it is the Word that brings that to our knowledge. And our knowledge changes, our conviction changes, and our heart changes. See, And that's all done through a knowledge of the law of the Lord. Well, in Acts chapter 2, and we'll get into this in just a moment. In Acts chapter 2, we're going to talk about perhaps the greatest day. It's the hub of the New Testament in Acts chapter, chapter 2. And uh, what happened then? It's a major turning point in the whole Bible story. And we're going to talk about Acts chapter 2. But I want you to think with me for just a minute. Have you ever heard someone say that salvation is wholly an act of God? Have you ever heard somebody say that? That conversion is wholly an action of God. You can't do anything about it. God either does it to you or... He doesn't. Now if you think about that, if, if salvation, if conversion is wholly of God and man has no part in it, then ask yourself the question, whose fault is it that anyone's lost? Would it not be God's fault that people are lost? If man has nothing to do with his salvation and there is to man is totally out of the picture when it comes to salvation, then does that argue also that God put us in a lost state? Because in order to be converted, we must have been something we shouldn't have been. Who made us that way? Did God make us sinners, friends? I deny that. We choose to sin. Each one of us sins, James chapter 1, when we are drawn away by our own lust and enticed. And that brings forth sin, and sin separates us from God. Right? So we choose that. Who's responsible for my sins? Me. Who's responsible for your sins? You. God did not make you to be totally depraved and wholly evil. He made you with choice. You can determine what you want to be. Now, there's another extreme that you hear also, and that is that man does it all. That it's all on man to be saved. Well, that's not true either. That's, that's certainly not the biblical thing. In, Je in Jeremiah 10, 23, it says there that it is not in man that walks to direct his own steps. So if it's not all on man and it is not all on God, then what does the Bible teach? Well, in John 3, 16, we must believe what God has done for us. He loved the world so much that he gave his son. We must believe that. In Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, we must believe that we're saved by grace through faith. And also in Matthew 13 and verse 15, man turns to the Lord. God does the saving. And so what does that mean? God heals, man turns. So there is the Bible pattern. Man must change. And when man changes, God will heal. So there's your biblical theology 
about conversion. Man and God, God in his plan, in his manifold wisdom, said that man will be given a plan. He can submit to it. He is broken. Man is, in his sins is broken. And he can come back to me. Conversion is a threefold change. The heart has to be changed. The life has to be changed. And the state of relationship has to be changed. So you see those things? The heart has to be changed. In Acts 15 and verse 9, it says there, Purifying your hearts by faith. Now how is my heart purified? Through faith. Well, faith comes by hearing something. Hearing God's word. So I hear God's word and I am cleansed, I can be cleansed by the hearing of that word. My intellect is changed by the hearing. My understanding is changed through the hearing. And then guess what? My emotions have a lot to do and have a part in my conversion. I am hurt that I have been separated from God. I'm hurt by my sins and I don't want to stay that way. I don't want to offend God. I want to be pleasing to Him. And so I say, what must I do? This is the question that was asked in Acts 2, in Acts 3, in Acts 4, and so on through the book of Acts. What must we do? We have to do something. We can't, we're helpless by ourselves. But what do we need to do? God tells us what to do, and what do we do? I don't want to do that. I don't like that, Lord, just like a child when offered, I'm hungry, and you give them something good to eat. Say, I don't want that. It's much like the way we are with God. God tells us, have faith, repent of your sins, confess Christ, and be baptized in water for the remission of your sins, and you'll be right relationship with me. And we say, I don't like that recipe. Well, how insolent, how rude, how sassy we are to God when he tells us what to do. And we balk at it, or we argue with God, as if maybe God needs some help understanding what it takes to save me. He made me, friends, made you too. He well knows what it takes to save a person. And you know what's also awesome? Is it's the same answer for everybody. He doesn't give a different answer for this one, that one, or that, because he's not a respecter of persons. So it's on me to allow the Word of God to be active in my life and to change me. Now this is true whether I'm a Christian or whether I'm not. After I obey the Gospel, I've got to continue to let God's Word change me. And my conversion is an ongoing process. I am converted to the Lord, but I never get to a point where I am not supposed to be willing to change when I find out that I've done something wrong. So I continue in that. Well, the essential steps of conversion are very clear. You can't turn to one thing without turning from something else. So what am I turning from? I'm turning from sin. All right? Now someone says, well, what do you mean by that? Well, let's look and see the situation in Genesis 3 with Adam and Eve. Notice the process that they were in. Now they were wrong, or they, I'm sorry, they were right to start with. Perfect relationship with God. But Satan came and tempted Eve, and she sinned. And she caused the man to sin. And they both were ashamed and went and hid themselves from God. They really didn't hide from God, but they were ashamed to even stand before God. Why? Because sin had separated them. All right, so what did God do? Okay. Well, in the, in the Garden of Eden, did you know there was a preacher there? There was God, who was the true preacher, who said, Do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For in the day that you eat thereof, you will surely die. But we also had another preacher in the garden, and that was Satan. He came up and said, Change one word. And notice what he said. Hath not the Lord said? Okay. In the day that you eat, thou shalt surely die? And Eve said, yes. He said, well, I say to you that in the day that thou eatest, thou shalt not surely die. 
So he just contradicted God. Isn't that what false teachers do today? They contradict God. So we hear some people say, you don't have to be baptized to be saved. You don't have to have faith. You don't have to repent. Matter of fact, you don't have to do anything. It's wholly God's part. And then we have God saying, no, you must repent and be baptized. You must have faith, Hebrews 11, 6. You must repent of your sins, Hebrews 11, or repent of your sins, Acts 2, 38. And you must confess Jesus Christ, Acts 8, verse 36 through 39. So that's what God says, and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Now, God says that, man says, oh no, nothing you can do. It's all on God. You believe. You see the situation's the same. We're thousands of years apart from the, from the Garden of Eden. But the same procedures keeps coming back. Who do you believe? Do you believe error or do you believe God? Do you believe God's power, God's word, Romans 1.16? We are in an area, and I'm venturing to say that everyone who is watching tonight is a Bible believer. You believe this Bible, don't you? You believe it's the inspired Word of God. And part of the problems that we're facing today in our society are a result of coming away from this book, not going toward it. So how do we restore morality and sense? We come back to the Bible. How do we restore and all be one in religious matters? We come back to the Bible, friends. That's how we do that. And we let God's Word change us. We are converted fully to what God says. Well, notice what happened with Eve. She believed the lie. And when she believed the lie, she became guilty because she was in sin. She followed through on it. She ate of the tree. She acted on her, on her belief that she was right. Now, Someone says, well, was she sincere or not? I don't know. I'm just saying that sometimes people can sincerely do something that's wrong. All the time thinking maybe it's okay to do. That may describe you. I'm not going to look into your motives as to why you're in the relationship you are, if it's wrong before God. But I am telling you, if you're an honest person, you'll look at the Bible and see whether you're, what you did is the right thing that God says to do. Or is it just some dogma that your church teaches? Well, look if you will also, the steps that man takes to return to the Lord. Man is in sin. The Word, Psalm 19.7, we read, the Word of the Lord is good, and it converts the soul. The Word of the Lord converts the soul, Psalm 19.7. John 6 and verse 45, those who hear and learn come to Christ. They do what Christ says. They follow him. Who shall we turn to? We're going to come and do what God says. So God uses the agencies of the truth, preachers and teachers of truth, and he brings the truth to others. He presents it and has delivered it through the Spirit, and delivered it to the apostles, and we have the gospel of Jesus Christ today. And it will, it will convict your heart and change you if you believe it. Now, are there differences between conversion and pardon? Is there any difference in that? Well, conversion takes place in the mind of man, and pardon takes place in the mind of God. Now, I may be pardoned, but I can't pardon myself. I, notice that conviction takes place in man's heart. Pardon takes place in God's mind. God is the one who grants pardon and remission of sins, not man. No man can do that. I know of different religions today, the Catholic Church, I believe, the priest can say, I absolve you, I absolve you of sin. Well, no man has that power. To do that. God only has that power. Now, a man in prison may be pardoned to some degree. He may have his sentence shortened, but he's still guilty of his sin, right? Of his crime. Now, because he has been given a leniency by the law, does that mean that he's able to walk away because he's in 
give, given some leniency that all of a sudden he could just he's freed no and in the same way just because God is willing to pardon us for our sins doesn't mean we can continue in them doesn't mean that they're all over unless we repent of them you see God is willing to pardon man must be willing to change and be converted okay so we have a dual situation there and we are convicted by the Word of God so is it our fault if we're never converted Is it God's fault if we're never converted? Maybe God hasn't been clear. Maybe that's it. Maybe the Bible is just an obscure book that no one can understand and God gave us and delivered us a book and that he knows we can't understand and so God is flawed so we are lost because of God. No. We're lost because of us. Anyone that is going to be lost is lost on their own. Because God has given ample proof and ample guidance on what to do. Much like going to the doctor. Have you ever argued with your doctor? I can almost hear some of you saying, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll confess something. I've argued about my doctor. The doctor has gone to school. He has all types of credentials. And many people today think they can outdo the doctor. And so they go to Google. Or they go to Dr. Oz, or they go to some TV program. And they get their information from that, and they say, okay, I'm going to do that. Well, what they do is they find out that that advice for them is not the best advice. No one knows you like your own doctor does. And so he gives you, and he is able, because he sees you, because he talks with you, and because he understands, now I know somebody's going to say a lot of doctors don't do that today. They come in and out and they don't even know. Okay, we're not arguing that. A doctor who is who he should be, let me say that, will know his patients. And will be able to adequately guide us to physical life. And the changes we need to make. Well, what do we do with our doctors? Well, I know better than he does. He's all wet. He doesn't have any idea what he's talking about. You see how what we do? Here's the authority. We pay them money to be the authority. And then we second guess them and say, oh, I'm not doing that. Well, somebody says, I'm in charge of my own. So I'm going to do this my, my own way. That's dangerous area to be on, isn't it? On what basis? Have you studied? Do you know? Now, can a doctor be wrong? Yes. But I'll tell you where the parallel stops. God can't be wrong. The great physician is not wrong. So every time you come to this book and consult it, and you allow the great physician, Jesus, to speak through his word to you, then you will have healing that comes from that. There will be a mending. There will be a restoration. There's pardon there. But it's not unconditional. You must submit your will to his. You must be converted from what you have been into what he wants you to be. And you must be willing to do that no matter the cost. There are people today that act like they're surprised to death to find out that they have to change anything to be a servant of the Lord. There's even churches that'll tell you you don't have to change anything to be a servant of the Lord. There's all kinds of community churches out here, and I've seen their advertisements on TV, and you have too, and at the movies. They tell you, you don't have to change anything. You just come like you are. Well, they don't mean come dress like you are. They mean come like you are. And you don't have to repent of anything. You don't have to do anything. You just come be a part of them. Well, you know what? That's a pretty good deal. That which expects nothing of me, and I can serve however I want to, eh, I might have some of that. A kind of a pastime religion. But you know what? It's a cheap knockoff is what that is. Because the Bible says that, you know what? If you want to follow the Lord, you can't be partially converted. You have to be totally into it. Totally changed. It's all in, folks. No halfway in, halfway out. 
Matthew 6, 24, God and man. You can't serve God and man. You just can't do that. You have to choose who you're going to be with. And if you choose that you're sort of going to be with God, you've chosen to be with the world. Because the Lord won't accept any type of service but all in. Well, let's look at Pentecost for just a moment. Have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, looking at verses 1 through 4, the apostles were baptized with the Holy Spirit, as has been promised. They were tarrying in Jerusalem, waiting until they were endued with power from on high. And that was in accordance with the prophecies of Joel and others. Now, what was going to happen on the day of Pentecost, and there's a number of things that are going to happen as we look at the book of Acts chapter 2. The power is going to come. The power comes, then the kingdom comes with the power. So the kingdom is going to come on the day of Pentecost. The law will change. There's a change in the law and the adherence to the law. The Jews cry out and say, men and brethren, what shall we do? They knew what to do under Jewish law, but they knew after hearing the lesson Peter preached, we know that the change was to take place, and they knew they needed to do something else. What shall we do? They were told to repent and be baptized, every one of them, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of their sins. All right? Now that's what they were told. So we have the new constitution that has been enacted now. It's in place. The new law is nailed to the cross. The old law was nailed to the cross. The new law is in force now. And the Spirit is poured out. And we also find that the sermon is preached is the sermon of the New Testament. Jesus Christ died, was buried, and arose. So the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ is preached from Joel, by the way. And the kingdom, what is happening, and Peter says this, what is happening right here is what the prophet Joel talked about. This is what's going to happen. And they could know very well about their, their, their learning. He's talking to Jews here. And we see here that the, from their own text, from the Old Testament, he takes the lesson that he is presenting to them. The Spirit guiding Peter and the other apostles in what they are saying. And it is all couched in the prophecies. Salvation is received in verse 38. It is for everyone. He that believes and is baptized. Not Jews that believe. But he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. And again, it's a required response to what God has given. God in His grace has thrown, has, has offered salvation to all men. That's a great message to the Jew because the Jew had to remember every year his sins from the year before and the year before and the year before. Now salvation is accomplished. Jesus, the Messiah, who is talked about as the seed promise in Genesis chapter 12, he is here, he has come, he has died, he has been buried, and he has risen. And when he, he is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God, and he is ruling and reigning right now over his kingdom. Now friends, let me ask you something. Do you believe Jesus Christ has a kingdom right now? That he's ruling over? Now, if you say, yes, I believe that, then let me ask you something. Why do you believe, if you, if you do, and you may not believe this, but why would anyone believe that the kingdom is yet to come? And that it's physical. That it'll be on this earth. That it's not spiritual, as prophesied by Daniel in Daniel 2.44. So why would anybody believe the premillennial ideas. If Jesus is reigning over his kingdom right now, do you serve a king? Or do you serve someone who thinks he's a king, but really isn't? That makes all the difference in the world, doesn't it, about our belief. 
someone says, well, you know, you don't have to worry about this rapture and Armageddon and tribulation. Uh, yes, you do. Yes, you do. Because it's false doctrine. It basically says that Jesus Christ came one time, but he failed to set up his kingdom. So he's going to come back later and set up his kingdom. Well, if he failed once, what makes us think he won't fail again? We're serving a flawed Christ. We're serving a flawed God. If he was intending to pull something off and he couldn't do it, so he's not almighty. You see how that doctrine hits at the heart of the nature of God? So what's wrong with false teaching? It impugns God. And that should anger us, folks, in the right way. It should make us uh, get lose it. But it should anger us that someone is out there teaching such subtle doctrines that undermine the core of our faith. If God is not almighty and all-powerful, and if God cannot pull off what he has planned to pull off, then I'm not serving him. I'm not serving a God who is flawed. Nor should you. But God has, the good news is that God has and does pull off everything that he has planned. He works all things according to his purposes and according to his will. And he has revealed to man our role in this world. We know why we're here. We know where we're going. We know all the things that are necessary to take us to eternal life with God. So we know all the things necessary, and God has revealed to us his will. A map to heaven. This is how you get there. Now, it's through his grace that he's delivered that map. It's through his willingness to pardon us from our sins that he even gave us this map. His love for us. So we see love, grace, and mercy, God's part. Pardon, God's part. Obedience, submission, conversion, conviction, man's part. You see, all of us have a role, don't we? Now, do you need? Do you have to change? No, that's one of the wonderful things about God's, God's arrangement and how he made us. Did you know we're the only part of God's creation that can refuse to do what he says? He made us that way. Someone says, well, why did he make me that way? Because he wants us to bring him glory in submitting and willingly saying, I want to serve you. We are the highest form of creation, friends. We didn't evolve from some type of lower life form. God made us different. And he wants us to glorify and praise him on our own. That because we choose to do that. The whole idea of love is that we choose to serve the Lord. He loves us, we love him. All right. Now in Acts 2, verses 5 through 13, we see the apostles were baptized with the Holy Spirit in verses 1 through 4 as promised. And there was a promise, by the way, this baptism of the Holy Spirit is a promise made to the apostles and also to the household of Cornelius. And that's it, it never was a command. So if you're waiting to be baptized with the Holy Spirit like the apostles were in the household of Cornelius, you're, it's not going to happen. Because it was only given to those two, two groups. Now in Acts chapter 2, verses 5 to 13, the people present responded to what they had seen and heard in their own language. So you had miraculous things happening. Particularly everyone that was there, and there were some 19 different nations represented there, they were all understanding in their own language. And they marveled. And they said, this is amazing. These men are Galileans. They're not educated. How are we hearing everything they hear? We all are hearing in our own tongue. Well, they were speaking. And everyone was understanding in their own tongue. That was miraculous. In Acts chapter 2, verses 14 to 36, Peter's sermon is very clear. It has a proposition, it has a proof, and it has a conclusion. The conclusion is that Jesus of Nazareth is the promised Messiah. And you killed him. You killed your own Messiah. That had to just... <laughs> 
And it did. It made them cry out. Men and brethren, what shall we do? Do about what? We just killed our Messiah. 3,000 people believe that. And they said, what shall we do? This is horrible that we, we've been looking for the Messiah all of our lives in our nation and we've not seen him yet and we knew he was coming and here he was in our midst and we killed him. You, and Peter didn't back up on this, you with wicked hands have taken and crucified the Son of God, your Messiah. And so their reply was, men and brethren, what shall we do? What are your sins, friends? You ever heard somebody say, maybe you're one of them watching tonight, that your sins are so horrible that God would never forgive you. Well, friends, I doubt if your sins all put together would amount to what the people on the day of Pentecost had done. They crucified God. Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. The Messiah, the Emmanuel, the Prince of Peace. And they put him on a cross and they killed him. You haven't done that, have you? Somebody says, well, the way I've lived has been pretty close to doing something like that. Okay, I grant that. Our sins are horrible. I'm not trying to minimize our sins. But no sin is out there that God is not willing to forgive if we will repent and turn from what we've done and have godly sorrow for what we've done. The Lord will forgive us of our sins if we come under his conditions of pardon. Get into relationship with him and keep our lives in accordance with his will. And he is ever ready to repent or to, to, to uh, forgive us. In Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 47, going down to verses 37 through 41, the effects of the truth is that those that heard the truth and responded to the truth were added to something. What were they added to? When they were baptized in water for the remission of their sins, they were added to the body of Christ, the church of the Lord. So, Jesus' blood, when he died on the cross, not only, in Acts 20 and verse 28, the elders, the, uh, the Ephesian elders are told to feed the church of God, which is among them that he, God, that he has purchased with his own blood. So the blood of Christ not only forgives people of sin, but it purchased the church, not the churches. It purchased his church. So it would only stand to reason in Acts 2 and verse 37 through 41 that when those who were baptized for the remission of their sins were added by God to the church that Jesus purchased with his blood. That makes all kinds of sense, doesn't it? Now, what was the price for the church of the New Testament? The blood of Christ. What was the price paid for the church where you go? Do you know that all denominationalism is today is a knockoff of the true of the true point of the scriptures? There's only one church mentioned in the Bible. Do you know that? Only one. And I'll tell you, there's not a scholar around that can argue that it's okay to have a bunch of them and be biblical. Now you may want it to be true. You may want it to be that the Lord is able to be and he's, he's in all churches and he loves everybody and he doesn't care how we worship just so we love him. Well, you, you see, that would, that would be all right if it was authorized, but it's not authorized. You can't just go become a member of a man-made body and ask God to be pleased with that. When you're added to, when you are a true Christian, not a Christian as we use the term, but a true Christian. The Lord adds you to his church. And you function as he has commanded you to do according to the pattern of the sound words of scripture. And notice in Acts chapter 2 verses 41 through 47, those people who were converted continued steadfastly 
In the apostles' doctrine, breaking of bread and prayer, the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Let's look at Acts chapter 2 for just a moment. And let's read, because nothing beats reading. When the day of Pentecost, verse 1, was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. That's the apostles. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a mighty rushing wind that filled the house where they were sitting. Why were they sitting in a house? Because the Lord told them to. And wait until they were abdue, endued with power from on high. That was their sign. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. They weren't fire. They were like as fire. And it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Who is the them? It's the ones that were the apostles. And they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men, of every nation under heaven. And when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded, because every man heard them speak in his own language, and they were all amazed. And they marveled and said one to another, Behold, are not these Galileans? And how do we hear every man in our own tongue? And then he enumerates the different nations that are there. What does this mean, they said in verse 12. Why would they ask that? Because this was an event that hadn't happened before. It won't ever happen again. This was the inception of the church. The establishment of the New Testament church. Some of them mocked. And you always have the mockers. And they said, these guys are drunk. Well, somebody spoke up and said, well, they couldn't be drunk. We can't be drunk. In verse 14, Peter said, and he starts here, he says, stands up with the eleven. There you are. Who is he with? Peter and the eleven are speaking. And he lifted up his voice and said to them, Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known, and listen to my words. These are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only the third hour of the day. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. You're hung over. You're not drunk if you've been drinking. But he says, these aren't drunk people. And then he says, and introduces his sermon this way. This is that that was spoken of the prophet Joel. They want to know what does this mean? What's happening in your observation right now is what Joel was talking about. And then he quotes Joel. He says here, and it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, and your old men dream dreams. On my servants and on my handmaids I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood, before the great and notable day of the Lord comes. It shall come to pass that whoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs that God did by him in the midst of you, you yourselves know. Him... Jesus, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and with wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held of it. For David speaks concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face. He is on my right hand, and I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh shall rest in hope, because you will not leave my soul in Hades, neither will I suffer my Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life, and shall make me full of joy with your countenance. Men and brethren, Peter says, let me freely speak to you of the patriarch David, that he's both dead and buried. And his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, 
that at the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spoke of the resurrection of Christ. Neither his uh, that his soul would not be left in Hades, nor his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, and we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Spirit, he has shed forth this, which you now see and hear. David is not ascended into the heavens, but he said to himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit on my right hand, until I make thy foes my footstool. So let all the house of Israel know for sure that God has made the same Jesus that ye have crucified both Lord and Christ. Powerful lesson. Powerful lesson. And what happened? Verse 38, 37. When they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And they were told, What? Well, you don't have to do anything. It's all on Jesus. It's all on God. There's nothing you can do. That's not what it says, is it? They were told by Peter, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. Ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is unto you, and unto your children, and to all those that are far off as many as the Lord shall call. How are we called? We're called through the gospel. And so who is the promise to? The promise of the Holy Spirit? That is salvation that comes. That promise refers all the way back to Abraham. And the gift of the Holy Spirit, friends, is not the Holy Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit is something, a gift is something the Spirit gives us. And that's salvation. So we are saved through Christ Jesus when we repent and are baptized for the remission of our sins. Now to those that say, well, remission of sins is, you can have remission of sins before baptism. Well, you got an argument with God in verse 38. The, the baptism must be for remission of sins. Now there's a lot who may be watching tonight who may, maybe you've been, Pardon me, maybe you've been baptized, but you've not been baptized for the remission of your sins. Maybe you've been baptized to join a church. Maybe you've been baptized because your sins were already remitted, but not in order to obtain. And that word for that's used there is the Greek word eis, E-I-S, and it means in order to obtain. Now there are those that want to insert the word gar, G-A-R there for for, and it just doesn't fit. The text does not allow it. But it does allow for gar to be used in verse 39. Because the promise is unto you. What promise? The promise made to Abraham that through him shall all nations of the earth be blessed. Through his seed. All right. so the seed, the fulfillment of the seed promise is Jesus. And Jesus' blood saves all men from sin that will be willing to come to him on his terms. You see, the pardon awaits. The conviction and the conversion must take place on our part. When we hear what God has said, and we do it, we're responsible for our sins, not God. <clears throat> so we must pursue the plan that God has given us in order to be saved. And that's exactly what they did in Acts chapter 2. Now look on, if you will. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. Now, isn't that interesting? Those who received the words that he said did what he said. They didn't argue with him. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and in prayer. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common. Some sold their possessions and their goods and parted them to all men and every, as every man had need. And they continued, watch this, daily 
With one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Who added them to, added them to his body? The Lord. They didn't join a church. The Lord added them to his church. What did they do in that church? They continued steadfastly the apostles' doctrine, breaking of bread and prayer. So they had activity as a congregation. They were doing things. Does the church have anything to do with salvation? Absolutely it does. We are saved. For Jesus Christ saves us through his blood. And we are added to the church. Do we have any obligations? Yes. To worship and not forsake the assembling of, himself, of ourselves together as the custom of some is. So we're supposed to meet together. We're supposed to partake of the Lord's Supper. We're supposed to involve ourselves in singing. Ephesians 5.19, Colossians 3.16. We're supposed to engage in giving of our means on the first day of the week. The Lord's Supper every first day of the week. And we pray and we study God's Word together on the first day of the week. Apostles' Doctrine. Well, that's what New Testament Christians did. And that's what people can do today if they're following the New Testament pattern, friends. Is that what's going on where you are? Is this, does this describe the church where you are? <clears throat> now, this is the beginning of the Great Commission being carried out. You remember what Jesus said in Matthew 28, 18 through 20? Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Go ye therefore and teach, and then after you have converted them, do what? Teach. Teach them what? To observe all that I have commanded. In Mark 16, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that disbelieves shall be condemned. Luke 24 is a parallel passage to the others we've just read. Well, so the Great Commission is being carried out. The very first ones to hear the gospel and become Christians are the people on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem. Pentecost was a feast day. Pentecost was a time when a lot of Jews were in Jerusalem. And they were understanding the things that were said and notice on the two men on the road to Emmaus said that everybody in Jerusalem knew about what happened with Jesus now look at at Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 3 many people shall go and say come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob and he will teach us of his ways and will walk in his paths for out of Zion that's Jerusalem shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. In Micah chapter 4 and verse 2, in Acts 11 and verse 15, these things are referred to in talking about the gospel events of hearing the truth and it coming forth from Jerusalem. In Acts 1 and verse 8, we find the whole story, the whole outline for the book of Acts. It starts in Jerusalem all the way through chapter 8. And then it goes into Judea and Samaria, and then to the uttermost parts of the world. So in Mark, Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, what did Jesus say there? Upon this rock, the rock that he was the confession, that he was the Christ, the Son of the living God, he would build his church, and the gates of Hades would not prevail against it, and he would give unto them the keys of the kingdom. Now you turn to Acts 2 and verse 47 you find the word church mentioned again. What does it say? The Lord added to his church. Ephesians 5 tells us that the church is the bride of Christ. It's the bride of Christ. It's also Ephesians 4 verse 4 it's his body. Ephesians 1 22 and 23 Colossians 1 18. He is the head of the body the church. One body, one head, one church. Now how many bodies are there? There's one. How many churches are there that please God? There's one. 
Now that's Bible, friends. But yet people tell you today that there are many churches and that nobody's wrong. Everybody's right. Well, the Lord's not pleased with that type of preaching, folks. He's not pleased with that type of belief. Because he, as any husband, is very jealous. And he wants it to be known that he's not a spiritual polygamist. He doesn't have wives here and there. He doesn't have brides here and there. He has one bride, the church, his church. And he's not out being a spiritual fornicator. And having this church okay and that church okay. And oh yeah, there's the true one. But you know, all these others are okay anyway also. You see, nobody believes that Jesus is that way. But the, the end result of the belief that many practice today that Jesus has people in all churches. Well, what that argues is that Jesus has spiritual children outside of his relationship with his bride. I don't believe that. And let me venture to say you don't either. So stop saying that you don't. You can go around and be a member of whatever church you want to be in and be pleasing to God. Because it's just not true, friends. And you don't believe where that will end up if you follow that line of reasoning. Well, the account of what happened on the day of Pentecost does not stand alone. Because as we go through the rest of the book of Acts, we find a pattern that is repeated. And that is that people are hearing the gospel. They are believing it. They are repenting of their sins. They're confessing Christ as their Savior. And they're being baptized in water for the remission of their sins. Now some things are not specifically mentioned in every, every one of the conversions that's mentioned in the book of Acts. But they're clearly implied. Elements of this conversion are consistent with every other account. And the necessity for every convert to Christ today. What they did, we do. Are we able to do that today? Now someone says, well now preacher, you don't even believe that. Because you don't believe that we have the same gifts that they have. No, I don't. Because the gifts that they had, the spiritual gifts of speaking in tongues, of interpreting tongues, that are mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, some nine of them, they were given because they did not have a New Testament to carry around with them. The gospel was in process and they had to have an ability in some, some way to know that the things that were being taught were true. And so God gave them those gifts until the perfect was come, 1 Corinthians 13. Until that which is perfect is come. When that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away with. Where there are prophecies, they shall cease. Where there's tongues, they will cease. When that which is perfect is come. The perfect is the completed word of God. We're reading through the, the epistles, and as you go through the epistles, those were in process. All the churches were hearing them. But how did they know? that somebody was speaking the truth. The spiritual gifts verified it. They were the verified word of God. They weren't just the words of men. They were the words of the Lord and given for men today. And we have the written word. Now let me ask you something. Which, which should you rather have? The spiritual gifts that verified a word that you had not even seen or understood yet? Or the whole story? I sure am glad I live on this side. Now we have the whole story here. The mystery revealed to us, all completed, all written down for us. Now, the apostles were equipped and confirmed to be the teachers that they were. <clears throat> Holy Spirit baptism is limited to the apostles and to the ones in the household of Cornelius. Again, all of this confirmed the authenticity of the message that was presented. And these things, Mark chapter 16 and verse 20, these things, these gifts that they had, would follow them. For what purpose? So that they might establish that what they were saying was true. Miracles never converted anybody. 
they verified the, ta the, the words that people were speaking. That's what they did. Now, in verses 5 through 13, the initial response on the day of Pentecost was they wondered. They wondered. And honestly, there's a lot of people today, when they observe that the pattern of the New Testament is un has, has already unfolded, they wonder. And it makes them hungry to know more. And they learn more. And as they learn more, what do they do? Just like on Pentecost. What shall we do? I didn't know this. And maybe you're that way tonight. Maybe we're talking about some things that you had not ever thought about. And you want to know more. If that's the case, you let us know. Call us now. We will come study the Bible with you. And we'll make sure that you know the things of God. Now the choice to obey them or not is up to you. That's your free will. To let the Word of God touch your heart. Now we will not try to manufacture some emotion with you. The Word of God will do that on its own. It will convict your heart. It will change your life. But you've got to let the Word speak to you. Not in some better felt than told experience, but logically read it and say, okay, this is, this is amazing. I need to do what this says. Devout Jews. Notice there were 3,000 that obeyed, but there were many others who did not. Devout Jews from every nation under heaven were there, including proselytes, verses 5 through 11. So there was a big crowd of them gathered together. And they were from all over the place. They were from Parthia, from Elam, from Mesopotamia, from Arabia, from Alexandria, Egypt, from Libya. They were from everywhere, from Athens, from Crete, from Asia, from Pontus, from Cappadocia from many places, from media. All these areas where people had come. The Jews from everywhere had come to Jerusalem. That was a part of the old law. Had to come to Jerusalem three times a year. And they were gathered there together. And that's when the Lord chose in the fullness of time to bring forth His church. So there they were. They heard the apostles speaking in their own language. Some wondered and were curious about it. Maybe they walked off and didn't do anything else. Others mocked. But there was the sincere ones who listened and said, we want to know about this. Okay? Jesus Christ, the conclusion here, is the anointed. He is the Christ. He's the Savior. He's the Lord and King. He's reigning on His throne now. He has a kingdom, he has a church, and there's only one of them. Now that's, that's what you find out from Acts 2. Now you've got to read something else to find out something different from that. To find the different churches that are around today, you're going to have to find another book than the Bible to find them. And you'll, you can Google right now, you can Google the church that you belong to. And it will tell you, Google will tell you what year it started. And every one of them is not the year 33 AD. <clears throat> so, what that argues is, every one of them is a counterfeit. So how are we going to find the church of the New Testament? We've got to go back to Jerusalem, where it started. We've got to go back to the times of Joel and see what was going to be taking place and see what was taking place because the church was very obviously begun in a way that was very visible. The crucifixion of Christ was according to the foreknowledge of God. The miracles of Christ were according to God's knowledge. God raising Jesus up from the dead was no accident. It agrees with prophecy, verse 25 through 29 of Acts 2. And also to sit on David's throne. Jesus sits on David's throne and was doing this. So then and is doing so now. He's reigning over his kingdom, friends. His kingdom is the church. He has one of them. He's the king over his kingdom. His subjects are not denominations. His subjects are individual Christians. Wherever they may be. The Holy Spirit verified the testimony. It was confirmed by the Old Testament prophets. So all that is spoken here is confirmed 
Their hearts were pricked by the evidence that was there. And remember, these were not ignorant Jews. These were devout Jews from everywhere. And when they heard the things that were being said, 3,000 of those devout Jews, they, did, they were not ignorant. They were pricked in their hearts by the evidence presented in this magnificent sermon recorded. Well, Peter instructs them as to what they must do. Repent. Let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Friends, tonight you may be carrying a heavy burden of sin in your life. And if you've never been baptized in water for the remission of your sins, that load can be lifted by the precious blood of your Savior. He's willing to change you. He's willing to turn you through His Word to the right paths and to grant you remission of your sins, unburden you from those sins that are just tearing you up. But you must be obedient. You must count the cost. You must be all in and willing to serve Him according to His, pro his, his uh, precepts. In Acts 2 and verse 40, with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Save, be saved from this perverse generation. And those that gladly received his words complied with what he had said. And they were baptized in water. Friends, you have to let the word of God break your hearts. You have to let it change you. And it will do that. Again, not by you having some experience where the Lord's whispering in your ear. Now on this Holy Spirit concept here that some people want to, want to spend time on today, let me just run one thing by you to think to, as far as what happened. The Holy Spirit fell on the apostles. You hear a lot of people today saying, I'm waiting for the Holy Spirit to fall on us, I'll fall on me. Well, it fell on the speaker. It didn't fall on the person being converted. But you have people giving their experiences and the Holy Spirit fell on me and I just couldn't do anything any different. You know, no. If you look at the Bible pattern here, the Holy Spirit was falling on the speakers. And the individuals were hearing, were reasoning, and they were concluding. When they were told what to do, they did what, the, what was said. Now, in Acts 2, ver, verse 42 through 47, they contained steadfastly the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. That's worship. That's New Testament worship. Notice, it doesn't say here, and they got them a band together, and uh, three people played the horn, and the Blues Brothers were all reorganized, and they went up, and they had a great big party, and they, they blew it out uh, with, with spiritual songs, put to really rockin' music. It doesn't say that, does it? There's dignity in what they did. There's reverence in what they did. There's sacredness in what they did. They worshiped the true God. And they did it in the way that He had commanded. They continued steadfastly in these things. It wasn't hit or miss. It wasn't, okay, I'm gonna come this Sunday, but I'm not gonna come next Sunday. Or I'm going to be here now, but not later. No, it wasn't any of that. There was steadfast commitment. They didn't give God their word and then back up on it. They didn't lie to God. And folks, I'm telling you something. There's a lot of Christians that have lied to God. He committed to Him when you obeyed the gospel. And if you're a Christian, a New Testament Christian, and you're not holding fast to the pattern of sound words, and you're not keeping your commitment you made to God, you're just as lost as somebody out here that's never been baptized. Because you put your hand to the plow and then you turn back. You're not fit for the kingdom. The Lord said repent. Don't serve him that way. That's like cheating on your wife. You cheated on God. You have committed spiritual fornication against the Lord. And you better straighten that up. If you're a Christian and you're going after what you want and serving yourself and serving the flesh and not the Lord, you better repent of it or you're going to be lost. Respect for God's Word was found in Mark 16 and verse 20. We find there that as they went out and taught, 
that they relied on the things that God had given. It took great faith to be a preacher and a presenter of God's word during that time because their lives were threatened. It took great, great pressure to be a Christian and great commitment because many of them lost their lives for being a Christian. That's so totally foreign to us in the land we live in. But friends, a time may be coming where we will be under threat of death if we worship God or if this program will never able to be able to get out. It'll be black marketed somewhere if somebody wants to hear it. It'll be underground. We have great freedoms here. Don't take them for granted. Listen to the things of God's word. We have freedom of worship. Avail yourself of it. And recognize that it could be taken away in a heartbeat. You look at the whole history of Rome, it's pretty quick what happened. In Acts 2 verse 44 through 46, all that believed were together. They had great love for one another. They were providing for one another's needs. And they were gladly serving God and sharing with one another. There was a happiness. There was a unity. Okay, we've waited for this all through the years. And now we are in the kingdom of the Lord. We are in right relationship with God. Our sins are forgiven. Oh my, this is wonderful. And they took care of one another. There's a family of God. There's a church. And they did not take it for granted. Well, they praised the Lord. Notice so many times that when children of Israel crossed the Red Sea, what did they do? They stopped to praise God. Miriam led them in song. And the song of Miriam is recorded. They praised the Lord. They praised Him for all He had done. The great events happened. Great victories took place. There was a praising of God for His goodness and for His grace of working with them and bringing them to where they are. These were people that were full of goodness. They were humble, serious, and devoted. Their life was appreciated, and they were saved. The Lord added to the church daily the saved. Can you imagine wishing all your life for a point where you could use that word? Not we're going to go sacrifice for sins that we'll have to do it again next year for. No, there's one high priest, there's one lamb, and the high priest has gone in once. The lamb has been offered once. The perfect lamb of God, Jesus. And now it is accomplished. We can be saved. Magnificent message, folks. You can be saved. No matter where you have been or what you've done, you can be saved. Now, would anybody else offer you something like that? The Lord says in Matthew 11, 28 through 30, Come unto me, all you who labor, or heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. You take my yoke upon you, and you learn of me, because I'm meek and I'm lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for your soul. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. You'll find rest for your soul, sweet rest. There are so many people that are so tormented, and maybe you're one who's watching tonight. You're so tormented with your own challenges and problems in life, brought about mainly by sin in your life. And you need relief from that. Jesus invites you, but you must come on his terms. Salvation is waiting. Will you come? with a broken heart and a humble spirit and a cup that is empty and say, Lord, fill it up. I need salvation. I will do what you have commanded. I'll not argue anymore. Now I want to show you a quote from a man's manual. Most people will argue that they don't know this book exists. And it may be possible for you to be a Baptist and never have any idea that this book exists. I'm not going to say whether you know this book exists or doesn't. <clears throat> but it is revised every so often. And it has come down through the years. It's called the Hiscox Standard Baptist Manual. It is a creed. 
It is a formulation of the beliefs of the Baptist churches. And notice, if you will, I'm going to read this. I want you to read it because this comes right straight out of this book. The Hiscock Standard Baptist Manual reads this way. It is most likely that in the apostolic age, when there was but one Lord, one faith, and one baptism, and no differing denominations existed, that the baptism of a convert by the very act constituted him a member of the church and at once endowed him with all the rights and privileges of full membership. In that sense, baptism was the door into the church. And then look at this last phrase. Now it is different. Now they've explained scripturally what happened in the book of Acts. There's one church, one baptism, one Lord, one faith. And a person became a member of the body of Christ when they were baptized, when Christ added them to the church. Now it's different. Now friends, that's on page 22 of this book. Go look it up. We're not misquoting this. That's really serious to do that. But notice, now it is different. Who made it different? What made it different? How did this happen? Look in the examples of conversion in the book of Acts. Pentecost, we talked about. Samaria, Acts 8, verse 5 through 13. The Ethiopian eunuch, Saul, Cornelius, Lydia, the jailer, the Corinthians, the Ephesians. By the way, I correct myself on this. I said the Samaritans were uh, Samarians were in Acts 3. They were not. That was a Jewish area, and that was still continuing in, in the Jewish areas of, of Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 8, it was Samaria and the uttermost parts of the world. And then notice what they did. These people believed. All of them did. They believed what? The words that were spoken. Now, Samarians believed. The eunuch believed. Saul of Tarsus believed that who, who presented himself to him was Jesus Christ. Cornelius and his household believed. Lydia believed. The jailer believed. The Corinthians believed. And the Ephesians believed. They, uh, they repented in, uh, on Pentecost. And we see in Samaria and, and the eunuch and all those, they, are, they changed. The jailer did repent and it's recorded that he called for, he washed their stripes. He was sorry that he had beaten these men for the things that they, had, that they were innocent of. Well, notice the confession. They confess with their mouth in every instance here, although not stated particularly. They all did this. They confessed. The eunuch confessed, verse 37, that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. All right, what was preached to them? The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and the kingdom was talked about. They were all baptized, every last one of them, and it is recorded that they were baptized. Okay? So each one of them was baptized for the remission of their sins. Now let's turn to Acts 8. If you have your Bibles, Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 25. So let's look at the Sumerians, okay? These are the people of the region of Samaria, and we see here the uh, teachings that are taking place. They were scattered abroad due to the persecutions that were coming. Philip was sent preaching in Samaria in Acts 8, verses 4 through 25. So Philip is the evangelist. Where did he come from? He came from Jerusalem in Acts chapter 6. We see him mentioned. And he goes out. He's not an apostle. He's a preacher. And he's going from Jerusalem up to Samaria. For what purpose? To preach to them in Samaria. Now in Acts chapter 8, verse 1 through 3, great persecution arose against the church. 
And we see that the involvement of Saul is mentioned there, that Saul was breathing out threatenings in Acts 9. And we see how wicked a man he was. This is later to be the Apostle Paul. But Christians are under great persecution. And so they scatter. And they go to Samaria and to Judea. Now the disciples were driven from Jerusalem, went everywhere preaching the gospel. So not only did the apostles go everywhere, but also the Christians went everywhere. And that's how evangelism takes place. Did they talk religion? They sure did. There's a lot of people today don't want to talk religion with you. But I tell you what, the Bible pattern is you talk religion. You talk about the, you talk about the Bible with people. And in verse 5 of Acts chapter 8, Philip preaches Jesus to the people there. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 35, that's what he's been preaching. He's preaching about Christ. In Acts 8, we see in Acts 8, 35, Philip was preaching Christ to the eunuch. The Samaritans are converted in verses 6 through 13. And we see also in verses 14 through 17, apostles send Peter and John to the Samaritans that they may receive miraculous spiritual gifts. Now that says that the miraculous spiritual gifts that they had could only be imparted by the apostles. Philip was not able to impart those. He wasn't an apostle. But Peter and John were because they were apostles so that they might receive miraculous spiritual gifts. So friends, if you're waiting to receive the gift of tongues, the way it's impar it was imparted is different. The apostles did that by the laying on of hands. In Acts 18 through verse 25, one of the Samaritans, Simon, falls and is restored. Now what that story is all about in Acts chapter 8, uh, 8 and verse 18, is here's a man that the people are fascinated with. He's a magician and he's pretty good at what he does. And he hears about Jesus and he sees the miracles that are performed to verify that what's being said is true and he's converted. He's a, a, he is a sincere co convert to Christ. Now you can imagine what changes a magician would have to make after he obeyed the gospel. And we can kind of sympathize with old Simon a little bit but we can't excuse him because the Bible doesn't excuse him. He sees these as he looks at them from a magician's viewpoint, neat tricks. And he looks at them that way, the miraculous gifts that are given. And he says, I'd like some of that. I'd like to know your secrets. Can you sell me some of these things? And they're told, he is told very straight and very quick, repent and pray God that the thought and intent of your heart be forgiven you. You're in the gall of bitterness and the bond of iniquity. You're in sin, Simon. You get that straight. Now notice he was not told to go be baptized again. He was not told to go repent again. He was told to change his life and change his behavior and be sorry for what he had done. He wasn't told to, to, to confess Jesus as his Savior initially again. All of these things were accomplished once. Now some of them continue. Repentance always continues. Baptism is a one and done situation. You're baptized into Christ, receive that blood, and it's applied in your life and it continues in your life. But you can fall away from the Lord. And he's told, a new convert is told to repent and pray God that the thought of his heart might be forgiven. Now, evil can work for good. In Acts 8 and verse 1 through 3, Saul was consenting to his death the death of Stephen. Here's Stephen, an evangelist, Philip, an evangelist, and the lessons that are being preached by these men are recorded, by Stephen is recorded particularly. And we see what happens there is he is stoned to death for preaching the gospel. Now, I have never been in that kind of danger. I've had some people didn't like what I said a lot of times, but I've never been in danger of people pummeling the life out of me by throwing rocks at me. But that's what happened with Stephen. He died for preaching Christ. It's awful hard for any of us to look at that sacrifice and to say that we have anything that should keep us from serving the Lord. 
He was consenting to their death. Saul was standing there and holding their coats. Now they were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. We can be guilty of participation by consent in sin today. God's enemies can't overcome his plans, and that's clear throughout the book of Acts. The gospel marches on. The truth marches on. Every type of effort to try to undermine it or destroy it is met with failure every time because you have faithful Christians that are keeping on, keeping on. And they will not bend, they will not bow, and they will not compromise the truth of God's word. So the truth keeps going. You ever wondered sometimes if maybe you're in a congregation somewhere where the, the majority of the Christians that are there just don't seem to care. What do you do as a faithful child of God? Well, in the Old Testament, the point is made to those who are the faithful remnant that if the foundations be destroyed, you keep doing what's right. That's what we do. We keep on doing the right thing. There are those who do not soil their garments in churches that are not right with God. And there comes a time where you may have to say, enough's enough, I've got to leave. But until then, you keep doing what is right. You keep on being faithful. And you don't let what other people do or don't do determine whether you're going to be faithful to the Lord or not. And if you're in a denomination of some kind and you've been listening, you've been watching the program and you're seeing that some things aren't right with where you are, you need to come out of them, of that situation. You need to change and get out of that because you're not going to get any stronger, spiritually speaking, by staying in error. Come out. So Stephen, in Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 3, is buried, great lamentation is had over him, and Saul goes on making havoc of the churches. Is there honor in the death of the godly? Did Stephen lose the battle? No, Stephen was the first Christian martyr. And yes, he lost his life for preaching the gospel, but Jesus said, blessed are you if that happens. If you're persecuted for righteousness sake, blessed are you. So you go out tomorrow and somebody hammers you about being spiritual, you say thank you, appreciate that. And they'll look at you like you're crazy. You say, no, I really mean that, thank you. I'm sorry you don't like it, I wish you did, but if, if you're upset with me for doing what's right, thank you. I appreciate it. Now what if we face the kind of persecution that the early church faced? You ever wonder about that? Oh, there's a certain amount of bluster in all of us that said, if somebody tells me I can't do it, I'm going to do it anyway. Well, that's no reason to serve God. We need to recognize that what we do in the small things, when we have the freedoms, determines whether we'll stand when the challenges come. Would you stand if somebody was going to kill your child? Put them to death in front of you. If you said Jesus Christ is the Son of God and your sovereign reign has the sovereign reign over his kingdom. That's what these people put up with. Many Christians died and saw their families slain in front of them because they were serving the Lord Jesus. <clears throat> I sometimes just frankly, you just want to hang your head as a Christian today and say, what am I worried about? What am I whining about? When you compare what we go through with what they went through, doesn't even come close, folks. So pick yourself up, dust yourself off, man up, and be God's child. The converted in the New Testament times were evangelistic. Notice as they left, they were, they were those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Now these were people that had jobs. These were people that had things to do. They were scattered. And they were really having a tough time, I'm sure, eating even. But they always found time to do what? To preach the word of God. They went preaching the word. What'd they preach? 
preach Christ. If we're truly converted to the Lord, we'll naturally want to tell others about it. And that's what makes us wonder sometimes how some Christians can hold the Word of God and, and not share it with anybody. Not even want to. Not take those opportunities to make those statements to those friends, those loved ones. There's been many times that I've heard people that, that are Christians say, well, I don't want to offend my loved one. You don't see that here. Now, they didn't want to go out and hurt people's feelings. But at the same time, they weren't going to be quiet about what they knew. But friends, it's our job to tell the message. And it's people's job to accept it or reject it. But it's our job to tell it. Tell the truth to the people that need to hear the truth. And there are souls lost in sin that need the gospel. There's hurting people out there that need the truth. You've got it if you've got the Word of God. Don't hold it to yourself. Don't keep it to yourself. Don't act like you're just scared to death that somebody's not going to be your friend. You'd be willing to risk that because you love them and because you care about them. The greatest thing you can do for your friends and your family is tell them the truth. And don't hesitate to do that. It'd be a sad thing to get to your funeral and say, well, you know, she had the truth or he had the truth, but he never would say anything about it. As opposed to, well, you know, mom or dad, they sure told us. You see, that's a whole different deal, isn't it? Whole different deal. Which, which would you like? I sure want my kids and my family to know what I believe and to understand what I believe. Whether they agree with it or not, to know it and to know where it came from. That it's not just the idea that we decided to be cantankerous and mean and not be what everybody else wanted us to be. There's a reason for why we did what we did. Everyone needs the gospel. In Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, all sin falls short of the glory of God. Don't be ashamed of the gospel of Christ, Romans 1.16. It is the power of God and the salvation to all those that believe. In Acts 8 and verse, 30, verse 5, the, uh, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. Now preaching Christ is preaching the Word of God. Jesus' death and burial and resurrection and His ascension, the Kingdom of God, Acts 8 and verse 12. The name of Jesus is proclaimed in Acts 8 and verse 12. Baptism is a part of the plan of Jesus when Jesus was preached to the eunuch. He came to water and he says, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? So baptism was a part of preaching Jesus, wasn't it? Well, the Samaritans believed. Isn't that interesting? Did all of them believe? No. Now, what was a Samaritan? Who was a Samaritan? Samaritans were people that were thought of as being pretty, pretty much the dregs of society among the Jews. They were the ones of Israel, the ten tribes, that had mingled themselves with the other nations. And now they're on equal ground with the devout Jews. Well, that was a big deal. For the Jews to be worshiping with the Samaritans, my goodness, that was a major deal. Big time bigotry was there. The Samaritans were lower than a dog to the Jew. They heeded the message. They heard and they saw. They believed as the, as the words were preached to them. They were baptized. Simon believed when he was baptized. The kingdom of God preached, the name of Jesus preached, baptism preached to them, and they believed it. These were not ignorant people again. Acts 8, 6, the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles that he did. Hearing, well, who is this guy? Well, he's verified what he's saying is true by the miracles he's done. Okay, I'll do what he said, because that's from God. You see how the miracles and the Word work together? The need for, for miraculous confirmation of the Word of God today is gone because it's already been confirmed by those miracles. And we're in a stage of advancement in the Gospel today to where we have the whole mystery revealed. From beginning to end, we know the whole story. It's not being written, it is written. The contrast between the miracles of God and the deceptions of men today is amazing. You know, if, if somebody claims to do, by the way, if you're, if you're a person that thinks you can do miracles, please call in. 
please call in now if you or if you know somebody that says they can do a miracle I want you to call in and I want to talk to you about getting that done and using our TV time to see you actually perform a miracle like they performed in the New Testament the first one will be drinking poison the next one will be handling a snake that's poisonous that you haven't trained and that snake biting you and you not dying now if you're up for that I'd like for you to do it. Raising the dead. I want you to go out in the graveyard with me and let's just raise one person. Restoring a limb. Healing somebody that's crippled from polio. Okay? I want you to do that. Because these are New Testament miracles. And they never were in question of what was being done. New Testament miracles have been done. I believe in every one of them. They did their job. They confirmed the word. And I believe the word. Because of the confirmation of the miracles that were there. But I don't need a miracle continuing all the time to believe God's word. We've got it. It's the inspired word of God. Well, the miracles serve to confirm the words that were spoken. The means of passing them on now is not available. We already talked about that. Genuine miracles could not be denied, even by those who didn't believe in them. Okay? Healing, healing somebody's blindness, that would be interesting. If somebody can do that, call in. Please do. And usually when we bring this up, the phone lines stay silent. But maybe you're an exception, and we hope you are. If you believe that can be done, back it up and be ready to come perform those things. We'll give you an audience. Let it be done. All right. The miracles did their appointed purpose. And they are done. Um, in Acts chapter 8 and verse 20, this is when Peter said to Simon, when he tried to buy the gift of the Holy Spirit, he said, I'll tell you something. You're in danger of perishing. Your heart's not right with God. You're poisoned with bitterness and the bound by iniquity. That's pretty serious. These are the sins that was laid to his charge. And they were told to repent and pray. 1 John 1, 9 and 10, the Lord will forgive the prayers of the righteous when they ask to be forgiven for what they've done. Now, the Samaritans were converted. They continued. When they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. So again, the conversions in the book of Acts that we'll be continuing to, st to study. These people were converted. They didn't just change their actions merely. They've changed their convictions. They changed their allegiances. They changed their thinking. They changed their will. They changed their commitment. They changed their relationship with God through a knowledge of the truth. And it was the truth that convicted them and converted them. True conversion, friends, again, let's remember this, results in a change in who we are, how we talk, where we go, what we do, how we dress, the whole core of our behavior. And we prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God by the way we live. And in order to do that, you've got to be all in, don't you? Now, to believe and do what the Samaritans did will make us the same things that made them. They were Christians. They believed the Word of God. They heeded it. They believed that Jesus was the Christ. They were obedient to Christ in baptism. Became citizens in the kingdom of the Lord. When one stumbled, he was told to repent and pray, and that's what he did. And he was right with God. Well, friends, what about you and I today? And notice, after they did these initial things, they continued steadfastly, Acts 2, in being what God called them to be, and that's separate. Well, we want to thank you for tuning in tonight. You've been very gracious to allow us in your home. And thank you again for being with us. If you have any questions, several have, we've gotten several calls tonight. And we appreciate every call we get because that shows someone concerned about 
biblical things. Your question may have nothing to do with what we're studying on the program, but we do thank you for your concern for the things that are spiritual. And thank you so much for your support of the program by your viewing it. We don't want you to send us any money, but we do invite you to attend at the Newton Church of Christ at 656 St. James Church Road in Newton. Or if you're listening from somewhere else, you find the nearest local church of Christ that is truly the Church of Christ. And you don't just take what's on the sign. You check them out. Make sure they abide by the pattern of the New Testament. And you worship there. Regular assembly times are each Sunday at Newton at 9.30 and then worship at 11. Then Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock. And you be a part of them. Go, go be, be with them. The Word and the Sword is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ. Fully supported by the Newton Church of Christ. And we don't want your money. The Church at Newton does not want any amount of money that you might feel compelled to give. We just want you to study the Bible and do what it says and be converted to Christ. You can contact us by email by going to contact at wordandsword.com and we're going to put this up on the, on the charts here. The Word and Sword brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ. Email contact at wordandsword.com or you can call the, church, the building at 828-465-3009 or you can just write a, write a, a letter to them and uh, P.O. Box 893, Newton, North Carolina at 28658, www.wordandsword.com. I don't know of a much better site on the internet than this one. And so you need to point, you need to get, to get on this site because it will give you all kinds of information that is truth. And you check it out. And if you find anything on there that is not true, you let it be known. And they'll change it. They'll pull it down. They'll change it. Well, tune in again on July the 16th at 8 p.m. We continue our study on conversions in the book of Acts and looking at seeing what's there. In the meantime, I challenge you to do this as we close out. Read the book of Acts and look and see and write down what the people did in the book of Acts to be saved. And then you put it all down and then you do it. And you'll find yourself in relationship to the Lord scripturally like the Bible says. Thank you again for your time tonight. You've been very gracious and we are honored that you have chosen to spend your time with us this evening. Thank you again for that. And we admonish you and we encourage you to search the scriptures for in them you will find eternal life. Thank you again and good evening.